President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. No. Thank you. We're running out of time. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I was delaying you long. There looked to be a stage wait here. Uh, <laughs> I usually peek around the corner there and somebody's speaking and then I kind of sneak down the hall so that I won't interrupt. And uh, the, uh, this time I just saw you sitting here in an empty podium. <laughs> so I hurried. But, uh, well, looking at all of you, you know, there are people that would suggest that the American eagle is an endangered species. <laughs> and there are other people right here in town that hope you are. <laughs> But uh, I want to thank Mike Kerb for what he's uh, contributed to increasing the number of you. And uh, Senator Paul Laxalt, who isn't with us here today, but our Chairman Frank Ferenkoff, and their commitment to building the Republican Party. And I uh, thank all of you. We need your help, but we also need your help in recruiting more eagles. Uh, let's increase the flock. But, uh, but you are very much needed, and I think you're, I think you're aware of that. I uh, came in here filled with so many things that I think ought to be uh, talked about uh, in the coming days ahead. Have you noticed how nobody's calling it Reaganomics anymore? <laughs> must be succeeding, it's all right with me. <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of other things that are on my mind uh, very much. The whole matter of uh, our national security, the matter of our uh, dealing in arms reductions and so forth, and we're going to continue with that. It's the only path to follow. Uh, peace must be our goal. Our greatest difficulty is making some of those people who habitually on the other side of the aisle up on Capitol Hill have always felt that the small change door drawer was uh, the defense budget. And any time you needed money for some of their uh, exotic experiments, you take it away from defense and they're still in that frame of mind. But we're going to have difficulty succeeding in getting the Russians to meet us halfway on the idea of arms reduction. The only thing that, will, that brought them to the table in the first place was the knowledge that we were going ahead with rearmament. It was all summed up in a cartoon once while Brezhnev was still alive. It was Brezhnev talking to a Russian officer and he said, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're trying to change that. But I've just thought, rather than me stand here and all of those things that are on my mind, you must have some things in your mind, and I don't have an awful lot of time, but I bet that some of you at time or another have said, if I had a chance, I'd like to ask him. <laughs> ask me. <laughs> Mr. President, I'm from Los Angeles, and uh, what I'd be interested in is under the capstone arrangement where the reserve forces go to wherever is necessary in event of hostilities, uh, at the present time, we don't have funds available to support that. Uh, I recently went to a capstone conference uh, in uh, New Orleans. Uh, there was no money to fund that, so you have to pay your own way uh, as a reserve officer. Are we going to get something uh, going towards the reserves? Yes, you are, and it's already begun, but again, it's still part of the whole fight that we're having up there on the hill uh, to get the things that we ask for. If I could just describe what happens in the defense budget. When we put the defense budget together, we don't deal in money. We deal in what do we need to meet the strategic plan 
that we have for the national security. What weapon systems? How many men? How much ammunition and fuel and so forth for training, uh, for readiness, transportation and so forth? And then you add up, having put that together as what you basically need to do the job and find out how much it costs and you ask for that amount of money. But up on the hill, they don't even look at that. They just talk the money. Let's take X number of billions of dollars. Let's cut it by X percent. And no consideration, not in any one of their minds is, what we're doing is eliminating this wing of aircraft or we're reducing this much manpower or we're canceling out a division or 30 ships or something of that kind. No, then the reduced budget comes back and then they have to sit down in the Pentagon and say, okay, what do we cancel? But the reserve was one of the weakest parts uh, prior to our coming here of the whole defense strategy. And as you know, an active reserve is one of the most important things. It's, you, you either have to maintain, as the Russians do, a gigantic military force, or you have to have an active reserve that you know can instantly be called up and be ready. But so there is increased funding and we are trying. I don't, I couldn't tell you if Cap were here, he could, where it comes in the priority scale, but I know there has been a great, uh, a great improvement in the defense buildup. Perhaps what money has been available might have gone to the National Guard uh, before the active reserve. I don't know about that. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Well, I didn't know about that book, but that I will look into that uh, on that booklet. If you send, if you if you send it to him, he I know he sent it to the Pentagon. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll I'll try to find out where or what the decision was on that. But we have uh, we have funding now for something in the line of of civil defense. We didn't have, you know, that was a part of the whole agreement, the MAD policy, mutual assured destruction, except that the Soviet Union never observed that. They have a fantastic a system of civil defense, including hardened shelters and factories underground and everything else. And for many years, under our predecessors, they paid no attention to that and did not let the American people know that that was going on in the Soviet Union. Well, someone, yes? Well, <laughs> our determination is that the good guys are the government, and I think this is the proof. If any of you remember, a little over a year ago, and for quite some time before, every day in the newspaper and every night on the evening news, you saw the El Salvador War. And always it was portrayed from the standpoint of the, that the good guys were the guerrillas and that, that they were the people representing the people. And then they had that election. And 83% of the people turned out, even though the guerrillas threatened to kill people that tried to vote. A congressional delegation, many of them hostile to our position, went down to observe. They came back and they came to my office and they talk about converted. They said that they had, they'd talked to a woman standing in the line who had stood there for hours waiting for her turn to vote. She had been wounded by the guerrillas, refused to leave the line for medical help until she had voted. A grandmother told them that the guerrillas had told her they'd kill her and her family. And she said to them, you can kill me, you can kill my family, you can kill our friends, you can't kill us all. 
They, they destroyed almost 400 buses and trucks the guerrillas did to keep the people from voting. It isn't easy like it is here. That's probably why only 50% of us vote. Um, <laughs> the, uh, over, they had to walk for hours out in the highways. They don't vote in their hometown. They come in to the city and all to vote. But 83% of them, and when they'd finished, they, they had proven that they were on the side of democracy and this government is the government elected by those people and now they're going to have another election and they're going to have it before this year is out, although it was only scheduled for next year. And the plain truth of the matter is uh, Cuba at Soviet, with Soviet backing and domination has established a foothold in Nicaragua. Cuba we know is their lackey and the arms that are coming in and the training to the guerrillas, that's not a bunch of peasants with muskets up there. That is a highly trained military organization. And they are backed, and the other day, a, a, a spokesman for Nicaragua openly stated that yes, they are beholden to the Soviet Union and to Cuba, and they, those are their friends. And what we're, uh, trying to do with regard to Central America, and we've had, well, I think we've established quite a relationship with Honduras and with Costa Rica, Guatemala, and the other countries down there, is persuade them that this is regional, that they're all next. And the ultimate goal is that the United States will wind up with a 2,000 mile border to our south, and everything below that border will be like Cuba. And uh, we feel that and we're trying to persuade the Congress and we're having trouble. Two-thirds of our aid is economic. One-third is military. And we're not getting involved in a Vietnam. We have trainers there trying to train their men. We trained a couple of their battalions up here, but they now can't spare the manpower to send them away for that long. But um, we don't have military advisors and we're not getting engaged in that. But we must win. Yes, ma'am. Mr. President, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You were there well, now, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. And, uh, uh, and to those of you who only read about it and said that and heard that there were anywhere from three to 5,000 people demonstrating against us, the crowd officially was 1,000 or less. Uh, but that's when they're hostiles, they multiply in the press. <laughs> Well, this is what our goal, the only solution to the Israel problem. They, they're living as an armed camp. They have a, over 100% inflation as a result. Uh, they're just, Egypt that they once were at war with has made peace with them, and what we're trying to create are more Egypts. And it begins, however, with getting them all out of Lebanon so that Lebanon can resume after eight years of bloodshed and interstrife, can resume uh, sovereignty over its own land. And um, that's the first step, and we're working with King Hussein uh, for him to take the lead in the negotiations on the Arab side and what we envisage, and we've made great progress with the more moderate Arab countries, is to get the Arab countries, begins with them and they're ready to recognize Israel's right to exist. We forget that most of the problem has been, that has kept Israel on edge, is that these other countries have said, we refuse to recognize that Israel has a right to exist as a nation. Now, they're ready to say that and then negotiate, and I think it's going to, the negotiation is going to involve the trade of some territory, because Israel still does occupy a land that they conquered in one of the wars, trade of territory for security. And the security would be peace treaties and friendly neighbors instead of the armed camp that they've been. I know that I've run out of time and there were many more hands, and I think you'll understand why I have to keep the next engagement. There is an anniversary or a, a not an anniversary, there is a reunion that is being held down the hall here, 31 ladies, and it is the first reunion that has ever been held of this particular group. They are 31 of the ladies who were captured in Corregidor and Bataan in World War II. 
uh, all but two of them were nurses. And uh, for the first time, they have been brought together and they're here in the White House and I'm going down to meet with them. I think it's a reunion that should have been held every year for the last 38 years. It was 38 years ago yesterday that they were freed by our forces. <laughs> Listen, the next time I'm going to make the answers. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> Mr. President, why not have another handshake in outer space to prove to the world that we mean business as to peace? How about a shuttle salute handshake in space? That is something I don't think that anyone has thought of. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an astronaut or a space scientist, <laughs> but... Um, uh, let me see what the possibility that would be. I, I know that they are busy on the other side in creating a space station right now. And um, let's see uh, what might happen with that. But we, we do mean it. And we mean it very definitely. And so far, uh, they have been very reluctant to negotiate. Uh, they've met us halfway on my zero, zero proposal in the intermediate range weapons. Zero for us, and they'll have 162. Uh, <laughs> Well, okay, thank you all. Thank you.